Hey, what up all my tooth doctors and doctresses? Welcome to another video at the Tooth Factory. Today we're continuing with our central nervous system lecture series with number two on anxiolytics. Now, anxiolytics are basically benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and other sedatives or hypnotics. So, this lecture is put together by Dr. Karan Shah and presented by me, Dr. Rishi Shah. What is anxiety depicted in this picture is the confusion of the mind. It is the fear, the nervousness, the unawareness, or the weakness of the actual emotion of the mind. So let's keep in mind the word emotion, because today we'll be dealing with emotion, unlike movements that we dealt with during our first CNS lecture. Please go check it out so that we understand the mechanism on how the CNS works. Valium here is diazepam, uh, generally one of the most common medications given when it comes to treating anxiety. All right, so today, one of our most commonly asked questions, especially for any exam, whether it be BDS, BDS, or AFK, or INBDE, benzodiazepines and barbiturates are always, always a part of the exam. So without much ado, let's take on the show with our table of contents. It is general CNS overview. We'll begin with that. We'll understand the neurotransmission of CNS, the mesolimbic versus nigrostriatal pathways, and the role of GABA. Now, before we get into the actual pharmacology of the benzodiazepines, I need to tell you guys that this portion also exists in our CNS Lecture 1. So it is explained much more in detail over there. However, today we'll be focusing a lot more on the mesolimbic aspect of it. And then we'll actually move into the anti anxiety pharmacology with benzodiazepines in detail and barbiturates in detail. We'll also take a look at what the benzo antagonists are and other antidepressants such as the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that we'll discuss in the next lecture at antidepressants. Buspiron and other hypnotics which are non-benzos and important concepts at the end followed by references. So if this hasn't given you the hypnotics guys by the end of the lecture I promise you'll be hypnotized or possibly put to sleep and that's where we can use our pharmacology knowledge. Just kidding, guys. Try and stay awake. We're going to try and make it interesting. So here is a diagram of a GABA receptor. We know that it is a five subunit receptor. You can see there's two alphas, two betas, and one gamma. Benzodiazepines love this area, the gamma, whereas GABA, the natural neurotransmitter from our body, will attach at these sites. Ethanol, which is alcohol, another depressant of the CNS will attach actually at the membrane here, along with other steroids and barbiturates that are actually at the membrane itself. This is indicating that we're going to be dealing with chlorine ions or chloride ions that propagate the synaptic action potential. So with that review in mind, let's get on with today's first slide. We know that nervous system is divided into central and peripheral we're not going to be discussing this as this is discussed in the autonomic nervous system lecture in much detail. Please check it out, guys. Whereas central nervous system, we'll take a look at what brain and spinal cord have to do with today's lecture. This section we will brush up really fast as the CNS1 has a lot more detail of it. However, the central nervous system, we know it's brain and spinal cord. We know that the balance of various neurotransmitters will elicit various actions, unlike the per, uh, peripheral autonomic nervous system, which functioned only with acetylcholine and norepinephrine. In the CNS, we have numerous, we'll take a look at them. Then comes the movement of the body and behavioral patterns of the mind that are significant features of CNS that we will discuss in this series. So we've already discussed the movements, today we'll discuss the behavioral patterns. Naming some of the neurodegenerative diseases or other diseases uh, of the CNS, that includes neurodegenerative, we've already talked about that. Psychosis, bipolar, and mania is coming up in CNS Lecture 4. Convulsions, epilepsy, anxiety, depression, and hypnosis is where today we're going to be talking about these two topics here in CNS 2, and epilepsies and convulsions, we'll be talking about it in CNS 5. So the whole series is going to cover all of these anyways. 
Solutions to diseases, basically we need to balance the neurotransmissions and we need to balance the excitation and inhibition of the receptors. That's the only way you can. What needs to be understood, guys, is the most important method to mastering the CNS portion of the pharmacology, which is five lectures today, is to be able to understand basic concepts and the behavior through which the CNS actually acts. Once we understand that, the pharmacology becomes very easy. So, how does CNS conduct neurotransmission? We know there is an excitatory pathway, and we know there is an inhibitory pathway. Excitatory is associated with depolarization due to the ions that flow in and out of the actual neuron. And hyperpolarization is associated with inhibition. Balance of influx and efflux of ions we just talked about. That is the mechanism of action through which the CNS conducts its action potential or inhibits the action potentials. The names of CNS neurotransmitters that we'll talk about in this lecture are going to have to be dopamine and GABA, and we will touch up a little bit on serotonin. However, serotonin has a lot to do with the anti-depression lecture. So that is next lecture, guys. Okay, but we'll still get a little bit of a hint on it. Remember, these are mainly used in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so let's take a dive into our lecture for today with our mesolimbic pathways and negrostriatal. I'll get the negrostriatal out of the way because this is what we talked about in CNS1 lecture. It's the function of dopamine that causes locomotion. In other words, it has to do with the movement, the physical muscular activity of our body. It's the balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. However, mesolimbic, the focus for today, is when the dopamine transport allows for things like pleasure, reward, and motivational functions. In other words, it controls our behavioral traits. Therefore, the balance then becomes between dopamine and serotonin. Remember, serotonin, so if it's dopamine is increased and serotonin, which is 5-HT, guys, remember the initials for it, 5-HT? When this is reduced, then we need to understand that this is going to create a bad mood. So what is our goal? Our goal is to flip this equation around. We need to increase the serotonin. Okay, that's the goal. This is more explored in the antipsychotic and antidepression lecture anyways with the role of serotonin, but this is just a brief example of how that is conducted. Okay, let's take a look at where dopamine pathway actually begins and we'll follow the red arrow today. It's the mesolimbic pathway. It goes to the limbic system and creates emotion. Now, I will share with you guys a little balance here. First of all, consider this, that no matter what happens, today we're going to be talking about GABA as receptors and neurotransmitters. Okay? There's another neurotransmitter called glutamate. Glutamate. And that is a neurotransmitter which is excitatory excitatory whereas GABA is inhibitory so think of it this way if GABA receptors are activated or GABA neurotransmitters are activated in the limbic system then there will be a suppression of CNS correct whereas glutamate will enhance the CNS so what's our goal today in anxiety speaking of anxiety our CNS is extremely active. We're thinking way too much, overthinking, over emotions, very sad, very confused. In that case, we need to calm the CNS down. So the anxiolytics will go to the limbic system using the mesolimbic route and ultimately reduce the excitation of CNS. Therefore, what, what do we need? We need GABA. Okay? That's the basic concept. Great, we've understood this. I'm gonna get rid of this from the screen, guys. Okay, so now in the mesolimbic pathway, let's see how dopamine acts. Whenever there is a reduction in dopamine, there will be a reduction in mood. However, let's put in serotonin. When there's a reduction in serotonin, there's a reduction in mood. Ultimately, what's the goal? Our goal is to flip this equation around. We want 
increase in serotonin, increase in dopamine. That's our goal. Okay? Moving on. We already know what this is, right? A synapse with a presynaptic vesicle, postsynaptic receptor. We know there's enzymes like MAO and COMT that break down neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, GABA, glutamate, acetylcholine, so on. Ion exchange are sodium, potassium, and chlorine. Today we'll specifically talk about chlorine channels because anti anxiety or anxiolytic drugs focus on these specifically. Okay, excitatory pathway of CNS. Again, this is from the first lecture where stimulation of excitatory neurons will cause ion movements through the channels at the presynaptic area as soon as basically in excitatory neurons such as ACH or let's say glutamate is attached to this receptor here. Then we have sodium channels open. As soon as sodium channels open, there is depolarization. Depolarization takes place. Depolarization means the membrane becomes positively charged. Remember, polarization meant a negative charge, whereas depolarization is positive. Right? Now, that positive charge will create an action potential. Basically, a stimulation of excitation. And that is done by either glutamate or acetylcholine. And the ion involved is sodium. And positive feedback just creates that cycle again. That's excitatory. But we don't want excitement. We want inhibition today, where the stimulation of inhibition through GABA or glycine, in this case, we'll focus on GABA, will create ion movements such as chlorine ions. It'll go inside, and potassium will go outside. This causes hyperpolarization. Remember, polarization was just negative. More than one negative is hyperpolarization. So if polarization is neutral and depolarization was excitation, then hyperpolarization should be inhibition. Therefore, hyperpolarization will be basically negatively charged membranes. See, Chlorine ions right here are opened, the channels are opened, and they travel through these channels when GABA is binding to the receptor. When there is a lot of chlorine inside, potassium will travel outside, creating hyperpolarization effect inside the membrane, leading to a reduction in neural excitability. In other words, it will cause inhibition inhibition okay so that's what we want we want gaba activation when it comes to treating anxiety okay all that review is done it's perfect now let's talk about the word anxiety there is a lot of confusion when it comes to anxiety psychosis and depression they are overlapping don't get me wrong they're not black or white there is a gray area whereas anxiety is an unpleasant state of tension, apprehension, and un uneasiness, where we just don't feel right. It could be fear, per se. Fear of unknown origin. Symptoms may include tachycardia, sweating, and palpitation. Remember, this means there is sympathetic activity. In other words, CNS, CVS is all stimulated. It is excited, and our job is to reduce that. And what is depression? Well, depression is the inability to experience the pleasures that usually existed, like riding a roller coaster. Now you just don't feel like doing it. You feel procrastinating. These are depression symptoms. The episodes of sadness and hopelessness, sleep changes, lethargy all day, and occasional suicidal thoughts. Okay, let's hope not. But that is still depression, guys. And it is a real diagnosis. We will talk about it in the next lecture. And this over here has to do with serotonin okay perfect what are psychosis and mania now we're just getting into a hyperactive state of our cns where we're talking about bipolar disorder or recognition disorders or schizophrenia psychosis and mania all of these are they're hand in hand we're talking about hallucinations hallucinations symptoms include hallucination delusions anger rapid thought speech pattern 
basically we're losing our mind. We're going crazy as normal uh, terms are stated. Psychosis is an actual medical diagnosis for the layman term, crazy. Okay, the GABA function. Now we're diving into the molecular aspect of anxiety. Major inhibitory neurotransmitter in CNS is GABA. Remember, inhibition is what GABA does. It seeks binding to GABA receptors, which are made up of either alpha, 2 beta, and 1 gamma. That is, sorry, 2 alpha, 2 beta, and 1 gamma. That is 5 subunits in total. That is a GABA receptor. As soon as the released GABA transmitter will bind, there will be an influx of chloride ions through those channels. Therefore, that causes hyperpolarization, leading to inhibition. Okay, so when chloride ions are stimulated, GABA will open the chloride channels. That is job one. Whereas benzodiazepines will bind at another receptor site, they will not bind at GABA itself. They have their own receptor site and they will enhance the existing GABA and more quantity of chloride ions will enter. However, in both cases, the result is hyperpolarization of the cell. Ultimately, the sympathetic nervous system, which was stimulated by anxiety, is now going to be inhibited, right? So what's our main purpose of this? Is anxiety will lead to increasing CNS stimulation plus increasing sympathetic nervous system. Then the body realizes this, they will then send GABA, and GABA will reduce the CNS stimulation and reduce the sympathetic activity. Now, what if this is not enough? That is when we use anxiolytic medications to enhance the activity of GABA. And that's where barbiturates, benzodiazepines, buspiron, all of these anxiolytics come into play. Okay, so mild episodes of unknown fears are normally common in life. There's no need for treatment, like an exam fear, for example. You don't need treatment for it initially. But chronic and severe episodes will need medications that are intended to calm the stimulated mesolimbic pathway. Remember, mesolimbic meant emotions. And stimulated sympathetic system. This is overall stimulation of the central nervous system as well. This requires anti-anxiety or anxiolytic drugs such as benzodiazepines and barbiturates. Some cases may not suffice. Therefore, we need certain antidepressants as well, such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is SSRIs. And in other cases of insomnia, when we can't sleep because how anxious we are, we need to use hypnotics and antihistamines for us to fall asleep. So, in basic terms, anxiolytics are benzodiazepines, barbiturates. Other categories are antidepressants, SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Buspiron is a newer drug that acts like benzodiazepines, but is a little better. We'll take a look at that in the future slides. And again, other Drugs include SSRIs and Zolpidem, Zelphone, and Ramiltec. Now, we'll take a look at all of these anyways ahead. So, let's classify anxiolytics by their names as well. All the benzodiazepines that we need to discuss about are mentioned here. We got Alprazolam, we got Diazepam, Midazolam, Lorazepam, Triazolam, Fluorazepam, Oxazepam, and the two chlors. Now, all of these are PAMs, whereas barbiturates are TALs. So, amobarbital, pentobarbital, phenobarbital, cecobarbital, and thiopental. Thiopental is a little different, but there's a TAL at the end. Okay, so we got PAMs, and we got TALs. And other anxiolytics will include antidepressants. We just talked about the SSRIs, but we'll take a look at this in the next lecture. And comes buzzpyron. This is a newer drug. Other hypnotics include antihistamines, you know, the ones we take when we have allergies, but the drowsy kind. Then we'll discuss this in the later CNS lectures as well. Uh, Doxepin, uh, Zolpidem, Zeloplon, and all of these other drugs we'll kind of hint at in the future as well. 
All the benzodiazepines, all of these are reversible. Let's say you took them because of a medical condition or a preoperative procedure, and we need to reverse them because now you're getting a lot of suppression of your CNS, a lot of suppression of your CVS and respiratory. In that case, we take flumazenil. Flumazenil is the official reversal of benzodiazepine because it's an antagonist. Barbiturates are very notorious for causing dependence, and it is now replaced by benzodiazepine. However, some drugs like thiopental, which is short-acting, in other words, actually, it's ultra. Correct that in your notes, you guys. It's ultra short-acting, and it is used to induce general anesthesia. So it's that strong, guys. And that's why there is a higher, uh, higher toxicity effect, higher dependence, higher tolerance. Therefore, barbiturates are not really good drugs. Other anxiolytics can be used to treat insomnia, which is a symptom of anxiety. Okay, let's dive into benzodiazepines themselves. What's the mechanism? How does benzodiazepine work? Now, by now, we should have understood what GABA is, right? Then it facilitates the GABA-induced opening of chloride channels by binding to alpha-1 and alpha-2 subunits, right? Right here. This is alpha-1, and just like this, another receptor will be alpha-2 of the GABA receptor. The sites that benzos bind are called BZ receptors. Benzos increase the frequency of chloride channel openings, which means more chlorine or more chloride ions will be able to flow through and cause even a further hyperpolarization. The longer duration is due to high albumin binding, which is plasma protein binding. Remember, this is in our pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics lecture, where a high albumin binding means whenever there is a more plasma protein binding, there is an increase in duration of action. This is because the only time a drug is active is when it is off of the taxi of albumin. Right? You take the drug, the drug goes to the blood, albumin picks up the, the drug on it as a taxi, delivers it to the site. But if it doesn't deliver, if albumin keeps it, then it stays in our body, in our blood for longer, causing an increase in duration. So remember, for it to be active, it had to come off of albumin. So high albumin binding means longer duration. Benzos usually have a rapid onset because they're highly lipid soluble. Remember, again, in our pharmacodynamics and kinetics lecture, we had spoken about solubility, where water soluble had a delayed onset. However, lipid soluble had a faster onset. So let's take a look at this diagram. When the receptor binding of GABA and benzodiazepines take place at the same time, in that case, entry of chlorine will hyperpolarize the cell, making it more difficult to depolarize, making it more difficult to be activated, stimulated. And therefore, there's a reduction in excitability. Perfect. That's what we want. We want to calm down the central nervous system. Binding of GABA is enhanced by benzodiazepines resulting in greater entry of chloride. So our body is doing it no matter what. It is controlling the CNS. However, when there is an actual disorder, a general anxiety disorder, in that case we need benzodiazepines to help GABA. Do its, do its job. Okay, benzodiazepines. What are the therapeutic actions? Well, we know that it reduces anxiety. We know that it causes sedation and hypnosis. We have heard this all lecture long. But the only difference is that anxiety is reduced at low doses as it inhibits mesolimbic system only, whereas sedation and hypnosis are caused at high doses of benzos as it artificially induces sleep. But more actions are available, such as enterograde amnesia which is inhibition of temporary formation of memories. Why would you need that? Well, think about it. If you have a patient who is extremely anxious to extractions, and they don't want to remember it, they're so scared. So we would give them a benzo dose. Once that occurs, they forget whatever happened because they're either sedated 
or they're facing anterograde amnesia. That's what happens. Anticonvulsants, we know that it treats epilepsies because one of the most common drugs for epilepsy, especially the condition called status epilepticus, and we'll discuss this more in the epilepsy lecture. The treatment is diazepam, the emergency drug, diazepam. And diazepam is a benzodiazepine, but only some benzos, not all of them. It can also cause muscle relaxation at high doses. Benzo benzos will inhibit the spinal cord GABA receptors. So it, what, what we want is to reduce the hyperactivity of skeletal muscles, and therefore it will attack spinal cord and inhibit the muscle activity. Now we'll talk about therapeutic uses. In which cases do we use them? We've talked about the actions. Let's talk about the conditions. The general anxiety disorder. Obsessive compulsion, post traumatic stress, performance anxiety, panic attacks, social anxiety, fears, all of these can be treated with long acting benzodiazepines, but they're subject to tolerance if used high doses at one to two weeks. That's a fact to remember, guys. Sleep disorders and insomnia can be treated by intermediate acting and long acting benzos. So now we've talked about two conditions in the same manner we talked about the previous actions. Then comes amnesia, can be used by short-acting drugs for anxiety-provoking procedures like endoscopy or traumatic dental procedures that we just talked about. Then come seizures that can be treated adjunctively, important word, adjunctively by benzos, like diazepam, which are drug of choice for status epilepticus. Muscular disorders like skeletal muscle spasms or spasticity in the neurodegenerative diseases are treated by benzos. So whenever there is tremors or spasms, we can give benzos. Okay, guys, I hope you guys are writing notes. These are very important points, especially for studying them for our exams. Benzodiazepines, pharmacokinetics. Now things are getting very interesting. Let's talk about absorption and distribution. We know they're lipophilic or lipid soluble drugs. Therefore, they will be rapidly absorbed. In fact, they will be completely absorbed from the oral uh, route and they will cross the blood brain barrier, right? Then comes the duration of action. We know they're short, intermediate, and long. We just talked about them. There's active metabolites. Active metabolites will be causing second sleep. Remember this term. I'm introducing this term right now for a reason because we will talk about what happens with active metabolites later on. So metabolism and excretion. Very important words here, hepatic and microsomal. Hepatic, we know it means liver. Microsomal, we can be redirected to our pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic lecture with CYP450 enzymes. So another word introduced in this slide alone, guys, are Benzodiazepines are metabolized by a family of CYP450 enzymes. They're microsomal enzymes in the liver. Some benzos like diazepam, after being metabolized, will create active metabolites, which means they're still active. They still have sedative and hypnotic properties. The redistribution takes place. And therefore, just the termination in urine is not sufficient to subside the effects because there's a second active effect. Benzos will then cross the blood-brain barrier, placenta to reach their target, and that is why it is not recommended during pregnancy and lactation. After the active metabolites are formed in the liver, there will be a redistribution into the body into either fat or adipose tissues, adipose tissues, and later on released to cause what we call second sleep effect. I hope that concept is now clear. So let's take a look at what active metabolites really do. Diazepam, for example, and we keep bringing back to this even from our title page today, diazepam and the chlorazepat and prazepam, all of these, the three drugs here, will produce nordazepam during their hepatic metabolism as their first metabolite. 
which then will move on forward towards oxazepam, which is the second active metabolite. Once all of that is used, then only it will produce termination in kidneys. Triazolam, midazolam, and alprazolam, all of these drugs will produce alpha hydroxyl derivatives. That's what it's called. Not very important to remember that word. However, it is important to remember that there will be byproducts in the liver, such as glycolic acid and lactic acid, and then it will terminate in kidneys. So, no second sleep in triazolam, midazolam, and alprazolam. However, temazepam is another drug that directly gives itself towards oxazepam, causing second sleep effect, and then it will terminate in kidneys. So, we notice that oxazepam here and oxazepam here cause a second sleep effect due to redistribution of active metabolites into the brain, into the fat tissues, adipose tissues, and then comes lorazepam, which directly just excretes without any metabolites. Awesome. Now let's classify them based on the duration of action, and then we'll take a look at their uses accordingly. So we're moving towards, we're bottlenecking, we're, we're moving towards a very specific type of benzodiazepines, a long acting, which has actions of one to three days, such as clorazepat, the other chlordiazepoxide, and diazepam, and all of these clonazepam. The reason why these are bolded is because they're most asked during exams. So diazepam, clonazepam, for example, are used for variety, various anxiety disorders due to its long-acting duration. However, because of long-acting, there can be a tolerance developed due to overuse for one to two weeks sudden. And diazepam is the drug of choice for status epilepticus and muscular spasticity. So we know this as a fact from previous slides. Then moving on to a shorter acting drug, which is intermediate in category for 10 to 20 hours. And we have alprazolam and lorazepam and temazepam and estazolam. Now, lorazepam and temazepam, again, are very commonly asked in the exams. That's why it's highlighted. It is used for sleep disorders, such as insomnia, clubbed with the use of both triazolam, which is short acting, and lorazepam, which is long acting. Lorazepam is a drug of choice for status epilepticus as well. Okay, so now we're putting two things together. When it comes to status epilepticus, we got lorazepam and we got diazepam, two of them together. And then comes short acting, which is three to eight hours. In this case, we got triazolam and midazolam. This is very commonly used in uh, dental practices where triazolam can be given to adults and midazolam can be given to children. And oxazepam is actually just a metabolite. Remember from our previous slide? Well, the use of pre-operation medications that facilitate amnesia during dental procedures, that can be used as short, right? You don't want long-acting for this purpose. You want short-acting. Similarly, you wouldn't want a short-acting drug to help you fall asleep. You'd want somewhere in the middle, intermediate. But if you have real deep anxiety disorders, would you want short acting? No, you want long acting. That is why they're put together in this format. So, oxazepam is used in alcohol withdrawal symptoms, and midazolam is good for pedo patients. Just for your notes, guys. Okay, adverse effects of benzodiazepines. The general view overall, we'll take a look at a deeper view later on, but generally it causes drowsiness and confusion, most commonly. Ataxia, which is at high doses, of course. Reduced long-term recall. This is associated with memory. Reduced new knowledge retention. Again, memory. Rapid tolerance to triazolam because it's short-acting and it goes in and out of the brain real fast, guys. Enhanced sedative effects with concomitant use with other CNS depressants. So if you use basically benzo, which is associated with depressing the CNS, and you add it with codeine, which is also going to depress the CNS. In this case, we're going to shut down the CNS itself. So we have to be very careful when clubbing two CNS depressants. The suppression of hypoxic drive. Now we're moving into respiratory. This is going to suppress our breathing mechanism because it will prevent 
CO2 from being detected. And if CO2 can be detected, we cannot breathe. The drug overdose possible with other use of alcohol. Again, alcohol is going to suppress, right? It is going to act on GABA as well. Its job is to inhibit RCNS. And again, when we use benzos, we can cause a drug overdose. Psychological and physiologic dependence at high doses for longer duration. Yes, for benzos, there is a possibility. And severe withdrawal effects if suddenly stopped. Therefore, we need to taper the doses. It can, if we don't taper it, it can then lead to a rebound, insomnia, anxiety, agitation, apprehension, and so on and forth. However, overall, when we're taking a look at all of these, we can safely say that benzodiazepines are safe because the lethal dose, basically the LD where taking that dose will kill you, is 1,000 folds greater than therapeutic dose. Therapeutic dose or effective dose is when you actually get the effects desired by the drug. And it is 1,000 times away. So basically, you need to give 1,000 times the dose of a diazepam in order to kill yourself. Right? So that's why it is safe. Well, look at morphine. You only need to give 10 times more. Okay, diving into the adverse effects, because we can now understand what GABA and what our benzodiazepines can do to the CNS, the CVS, the respiratory, and so on. So in the cardiovascular system, we know it will decrease the blood pressure at high doses, but it will increase the heart rate. So don't be tricked by this. It is just a matter of understanding the concept where the blood pressure is controlled by the CNS and the heart rate, which is the vasoconstriction of the vessels, is controlled by the peripheral nervous system in this case. And therefore, it will increase, whereas the blood pressure will decrease. Respiratory system, it decreases the hypoxic drive. Now, we've talked about hypoxic drive, but what is hypoxic drive? Hypoxic drive is the ability for us to exhale the existing carbon dioxide. See, what a hypoxic drive does is there are receptors in our body, such as in the carotid body, where they detect CO2 levels going up. Because of that, we force our body to exhale. Okay? When we exhale, we must breathe in oxygen. But if this drive is decreased, we cannot detect, hence we cannot breathe. Therefore, any respiratory disease that has to do with the hypoxic drive and the ability to exhale, and it is dependent on how much CO2 leaves our body, such as COPD, benzodiazepines must be avoided. So in severe COPD, we must contraindicate benzodiazepines. In dental consideration, we can expect xerostomia, glossitis, and metallic taste. A dry mouth, large tongue, and a terrible taste of medication. In the eyes, there is increase in intraocular pressure. Now, there is a mechanism, but in this lecture, we're only going to get to the fact of it, that it increases intraocular pressure. Therefore, it in essence causes glaucoma. If it causes glaucoma, then we cannot give them benzodiazepines with the people who are actually diagnosed with glaucoma. It can then lead to nystagmus, blurred vision, or diplopia, which is double vision. Paradoxical reaction, which means haywire, something unpredictable, completely opposite. They can actually cause excessive movements, excessive talking, emotional release, basically anger. So if a person has history of paradoxical reactions, then benzos should be avoided. And these are the systemic side effects of benzodiazepines. So benzodiazepines, the concept of CYP3A4. Okay, so we talked about the microsomal enzymes briefly a little bit. They're mainly, mainly formed in pharmacokinetics and dynamics video for details. So please go visit uh, those videos for the understanding of this concept. But let's take a look at how benzos are associated with it. So to begin with, there is a family called CYP450 of microsomal enzymes. Here are the members of the family. where 
3A4 is one of the largest constituent of this family. And benzos, like triazolam, when taken with the CYP3A4 inhibitors, the metabolism of benzos is reduced. Okay, that is way too confusing. So let's take a look at what that really means. So think of it this way, that CYP3A4 is a metabolism enzyme. But another drug, right, XYZ drug, comes into play which inhibits the action of CYP3A4. Then what happens? In that case, no metabolism. Therefore, more concentration of drug in blood. Therefore, there is a toxicity. Simple? Great. So when benzos, like triazolams, are taken with CYP3A4 inhibitors, then the metabolism of benzos is reduced, right? This will lead benzos toxicity in the blood, causing unintended increase in duration of benzos. Now these inhibitors, the inhibitors, are either erythromycin, the antibiotic, or azoles antifungals. Whenever these two drugs are present side by side with benzos like triazolam, then expect delayed metabolism of benzos, causing toxicity of benzodiazepines, leading to a more sedation. I hope that concept is clear. And for more details, of course, please, please visit the Pharmacokinetics and Dynamics video. There's a great explanation in that video. Okay, let's talk about a little bit of opposite. Too much suppression talked about. Now let's talk about reversal. There is a benzodiazepine antagonist, and that is known as lumazenil. It is a GABA receptor antagonist. It reverses rapidly the actions of benzos. It is administered IV only, again, rapid, right? Rapid onset, short duration, right? We only want it to reverse, not nothing else, therefore short duration. Half-life is about one hour. It is going to increase withdrawal symptoms because remember, benzos love to be tapered. In tapered, it is going to be normal. But if you abruptly reverse or stop benzos, then it will become abnormal. And abnormal is increase in withdrawal symptoms. It can cause epileptic seizures if benzos were being used for treatment of epilepsy. So say you're treating seizures and all of a sudden you stop using benzos then you could actually get epilepsy. Other side effects include dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and agitation. Flumazinil is able to reverse diazepam, midazolam, triazolam, oxazepam, zolpidem, and clonazepam. Like it, it can reverse all of these drugs in rapid onset. So why would you really want this? What's the indication? Well, in emergency cases, when there is an overdose of benzodiazepine, somebody took like 10 tablets of diazepine, then what do we do? We we'll put IV flumazenil in the body right away. Or post-operative sedation. Whenever there's a dental treatment where they took triazolam, however, they can't come out of the sedation for hours and hours. In that case, we can drip a flumazenil. Or post-operative respiratory depression. Say they had a general anesthesia procedure and now they're wanting to come out of it, but their respiration is being depressed. Well, we can reverse it by flumazenil. What about contraindications? Well, whenever a person has any sort of dependence, psychological, physiological, you don't want to use flumazenil because what happens is they're going to keep using benzos and they know that there's flumazenil to come out of it. So we can't positively feed the cycle of dependence. Okay, barbiturates. So we've moved out of benzodiazepines and now we're into barbiturates. Let's talk about the mechanism. It is formerly used as sedation and induction along with maintenance of sleep. So these are the true, the OG sedatives and hypnotics. But due to severe adverse reactions, tolerance development, physical dependence, the barbs have now been replaced by benzos, most of them. I'd say over 90% of them. But some barbs such as thiopental or theopental, which is ultra short acting, are still used today 
as a pre-op medication before general anesthesia administration because it kind of induces that deep sleep effect right before a general anesthesia procedure, for example. The main difference between the mechanisms of benzos and barbs, we know that they both act on GABA, okay? That is for sure. We've been talking about a lot of GABA today. Whereas benzos will increase the frequency of chloride channels opening, so more chloride, chloride ions can get in, while barbs will increase the duration of the channels that open. And again, chloride can go in. So ultimately, the action on GABA is the same. It enhances GABA. Although barbs potentiate GABA for inhibition, it is also seen to block the activity of glutamate. Now remember from earlier slides, guys, is glutamate is an excitatory. And what does barb do? Well, it blocks it. Glutamate is an excitatory transmitter. Ultimately, the inhibition of action potential of the neuron takes place. And voila, we have predation. Fair enough. That's the mechanism of barbs. So here is ben, uh, the GABA naturally. Here's benzodiazepines, the BZ receptors on alpha 1 and alpha 2 sites. This is where the alcohol acts and suppresses the CNS by activating GABA as well. Chlorine goes in and barbiturates are activated here at their own receptor sites. Okay, what are the therapeutic actions of barbs? First of all, it depresses the CNS and it depresses the respiratory. So let's take a look at when and why we need that. In depression of the CNS at low doses, it is capable of sedating the patient, just kind of waddling. They're still conscious and they respond to certain stimuli, but at high doses, there's hypnosis, there's anesthesia, could be coma and ultimately death. And that's why we don't like using barbs. There is no analgesia at all. In fact, it could actually increase, exacerbate the pain. The chronic use can obviously lead to tolerance that develops very quickly. And again, you, just as a reminder, guys, tolerance is when we use the same amount. The dose remains the same, but effect drops because we can't get enough of it. Therefore, we're going to need more and more dose to get the same effect. I hope that equation is clear. Just a little fact in there for us. Okay, for depression of respiration, it suppresses the hypoxic drive. All of a sudden, in our mind, the COPD bulb rises and we cannot use barbs with COPD. So remember, we're trying to put everything into equations, right? Suppression of the chemoreceptor response to CO2. Therefore, it suppresses the hypoxic drive. If overdose, respiratory arrest can cause death. So guess why we don't use barbs, guys? Because it kills you. Or it can kill you. It doesn't really kill, kill you, but it can. <laughs> okay. All right, barbiturate therapeutic uses. When do we use barbs, if we were allowed to use barbs? Well, during anesthesia induction. So induction of anesthesia is different than actually causing anesthesia. So remember, the ultra-short-acting Thiopenta will induce the anesthesia effect. Whereas anticonvulsant, the long acting, such as phenobarbital, have a non specific CNS depression that is scary as is because if it's non specific, all of the CNS is going to get depressed. But it treats tonic clonic and refractory status epilepticus. Now, what does refractory? Status epilepticus means. Whenever you hear the word refractory, we know that drugs have been used, but they were proven to be useless and they still have status epilepticus. So, whenever treated, but still the condition remains, that's called refractory. In this case, status epilepticus treated by diazepam or lorazepam didn't do the job. That's when we bring in long acting phenobarbital. However, the usage then causes the cognitive development depression in adults and children. So then why would we use it, right? And sedatives and hypnotics. Of course, it relieves anxiety. It relieves insomnia. It can also be used in the treatment of migraines, but in combination with acetaminophen, caffeine, aspirin, and caffeine. Right? One of the two combinations. This is combination one. 
combination two. Moving on, pharmacokinetics of barbiturates. Okay, we know that barbiturates act like benzos. So obviously, the majority of this process is going to be the same. But I'm going to circle one thing here that is actually different. Otherwise, we'll take a look at this in, in the following description. So first of all, absorption. Orally done very rapidly. Perfect, just like benzos. It crosses blood-brain barrier, placenta, redistributes itself in the brain and spinal cord. Great. It terminates in the effects for skeletal muscles in suppression. It deposits adipose tissues for substantial further effects, right? Your metabolism then takes place in the liver. Okay, guys, so up until here, we got all of this very similar to benzodiazepine. But this word here, induction of microsomal enzymes, CYP450. We'll take a look at more depth in the next slide. But what does that mean? Well, we know that this family here, CYP450, its job is to metabolize some drugs, right? Say drug XYZ, for example. But what barbs do is whenever they are taken together with these XYZ drugs, they hyperactivate the CYP450, which means there's going to be a hypermetabolism of these XYZ drugs. That will lead to a diminished effect of these XYZ drugs. In other words, due to the induction, the barbs will reduce the effects of all the other drugs taken concurrently, which are metabolized by the CYP450, because they will induce more metabolism of them. They will excrete them faster. They'll, they'll digest them really, really fast, and there will be a decrease effect of a drug taken along with barb. Excretion, active metabolites can go back to the liver and the body and the terminal effects, but inactive metabolites are eliminated through urine, so kidneys involved. Okay, the concept of CYP450. I know we've talked about a lot of this, but it's very important because questions are asked during the exams, guys. So let's take a look at what happens. The entire family can include categories like CYP2D6, CYP3A4, CYP1A2, etc. The drugs that fall under these categories, which are metabolized by CYP450 in the liver, are benzos, carbamazepine, propranolol, metaprolol. These are beta blockers. The tricyclic antidepressants. Next lecture, guys, CNS3. And azoles and antifungals. And many more, of course, right? These are all the affected drugs by the CYP450. This is great. It's in harmony. All of these are being metabolized. But whenever barbs are taken with these drugs, that's a problem because it hyper induces this metabolism. And therefore, the activity of these is reduced. The effects of these is reduced. So now let's put it into perspective with an example. If thiopental is used with diazepam, then what will happen? Well, the effect of diazepam will reduce because barbs love inducing CYP450. And CYP450's normal job is to metabolize diazepam. But because of this induction, CYP450 will metabolize diazepam really, really, really fast, causing a decrease effect. I hope that enzyme is clear, yes. Barbiturates based on duration of action. This is just a simple classification of the drugs of barbs. Long acting can last one to two days. Phenobarbital, mifobarbital, and primidone. Whereas short acting, three to eight hours, are pentobarbital, Cicobarbital and amobarbital. Ultra short acting, thiopental. And we kept talking about this guy here. Barbiturates, adverse effects, the general view. CYP450 induction, we talked in depth about this one. Excessive uncontrolled movements, such as tremors, can take place. Impaired concentration. Concentration can be impaired because of CNS clouding, mental clouding. Vertigo and drowsiness, along with nausea, especially vomiting as well. 
and high chance of addiction, which is why we don't use barbs. PNS depression, especially when taken with alcohol, just like benzos. And withdrawal symptoms can cause more anxiety, more weakness. Coma and death are always a part of the list. Because death can happen due to respiratory or CVS depression. So, that points us towards the contraindications. Such as acute intermittent porphyria, it's a circulatory blood disorder. Or a liver dysfunction, because it's so heavy on liver enzyme induction and liver metabolism that if a person with impaired liver function is present, barbiturates are not, not indicated for these patients. Coming to COPD. Severe COPD and, of course, history of any breathing issues, not, not a good drug to take care of because it can suppress the respiratory system by suppressing the hypoxic drive. And we talked in depth about hypoxic drive as well. So, addiction, drowsiness, nausea, vertigo, tremors, and enzyme induction. Terrible, terrible barbiturates. Now we're done with barbiturates. Let's talk about buspiron. The treatment of chronic general anxiety disorder. Perfect. Slow onset, and therefore it cannot be used for acute anxiety. It is an actual treatment regime. The actions are mediated by not affecting GABA at all. So now we're actually moving away from GABA for today. Like benzos. But it causes effects on serotonin and dopamine receptors. That's new for us, but it's great. You know why? Because there is no anticonvulsant effect, no muscle relaxant, no sedation. Wait a second, is that bad? Or is that good? Well, this we would like to have, but because of that, there is no psychomotor dysfunction. There is no cognitive dysfunction. There is no CNS depression. There is no dependence, right? So this may be the disadvantage, but this may be the advantage of using buspiron or in normal name is called buspar. This is the trade name. Non-benzodiazepine, benzodiazepine, receptor, agonist. What does that even mean, guys? Well, they bind two benzodiazepine receptors on GABA, but they're chemically different from the structure of benzodiazepines themselves. So they're actually non-benzodiazepines, but they bind to benzodiazepine receptor and they cause what benzodiazepines cause. How simple is that? So these are GABA supporting drugs, but they're not really benzos. They're imposters. The drugs include Zolpidem, Zalplon, and Ezzoplicone. These guys are, in other words, referred to as hypnotics. The treatment of insomnia as it causes hypnotic effects. The side effects may include daytime sedation and mental cloudiness, nightmares, amnesia, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, headaches, and peripheral edema. Other drugs in the treatment of insomnia? Well, we got antidepressants, we got antihistamines. Again, we'll talk about these on a separate basis. This got its own lecture. This got its own lecture. So we'll take a look at them in the future. However, antidepressants such as doxepin or tricyclic antidepressants such as trazodone, these are tricyclic and the selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And basically, they're hypnotics because they're causing antihistaminic activity. That brings us to this category. Remember antihistamines like cetrazine that we take? Well, hydroxyzine or diphenhydramine or Benadryl, all of these are antihistamines. And they only have side effects like anticholinergic, which is xerostomia, for example. All of them are using the treatment measures of insomnia. In other words, they are hypnotics. I hope I'm not boring you guys today as we bring ourselves to the very end of our lecture today. These are therapeutic disadvantages and advantages of all the drugs that we just talked about. All right, guys, that was the lecture for today. Our resources are in the description box below with Lippincott and Lippincott's textbooks. 
thank you for staying tuned with us. I know it was a long, boring lecture, but ENS number two is done. We'll move on to the third one with anti-depression. And over time, we'll move into psychosis. Thank you. Stay tuned. And hopefully, we learn lots of dentistry to help us pass our BDS, GDS, and all the exams necessary. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great day.